Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time and visiting this session before lunch, before the late lunch that we have today. Um, so in this session, I will talk uh, a lot about machine learning. Um, but I need to make a confession. So I'm kind of part of the hype game. So I, I figure that uh, I do some of the experience with, with experiments with Spark, and I include Spark in the title, then more people will show up. Um, and it seems to be the case. So I will cover Spark, um, but um, the, the talk is more general for machine learning itself. Um, so as part of Rapid Miner, um, I'm responsible for developing our big data products. But I have a background in academics and in machine learning, data mining, predictive analytics. Um, so I see a lot of good practices that our customers and prospects are doing. Uh, and I see quite some bad practices. And I would like to kind of share some, some insights uh, on, on what may be a good approach uh, for, for different machine learning uh, tasks and different machine learning problems uh, in the big data space. Um, so when we talk about machine learning, um, you have quite some tools to, to choose from. Um, so you have a good amount of tools when you're using just your own laptop. Uh, those tools have been uh, around for quite some time. They have lots of algorithms, lots of libraries that are available. Um, so you have, for example, R Python libraries uh, that you can use for all kinds of machine learning, data analytics, predictive modeling. And on the other hand, you have some up and coming tools on the um, Hadoop environment and the big data space. Uh, like Mahout, uh, Spark MLlib, H2O, and some others, um, which also have some traction, have some algorithms implemented, uh, but they usually come with, with some kind of complexity, some kind of pain, uh, because uh, it's not, they simply do not have the maturity uh, that other projects do. So when we are talking about modeling, predictive modeling, and big data, um, you can cite many, many big statements from, from big guys. For example, from Google, uh, who had this report published, um, and they were talking about um, how unreasonable it is that they do not really need to hire more PhDs and, and tweak all those algorithms, uh, but more like they are working on uh, getting more data and uh, collecting more data because they believe uh, and they also show it with experiments that if they have more data, uh, then their models, their predictions become better over time. There are also other publications uh, promoting the same, that you should always go for more data because your predictions will get, get better. Um, and you can stick with some, some simple basic algorithms probably, uh, but always try to collect more data. Um, on the other hand, so here the, sorry for the slides, it seems that uh, they're missing some, some parts. Um, so what they, talking, what they are talking about is um, that you have a certain amount of data, a certain algorithm, and if you have two choices, either collect more data and use the same algorithm, or have the same amount of data but use more complex algorithms, um, you should probably go for the first one. So they recommend that you should go for more data instead of better algorithms. And this is, this tends to be true, especially for very high dimensional problems uh, and sparse problems. So if you consider search or uh, text analytics, uh, you have very high dimensional space um, with, with different words uh, in each dimension, for example. Um, and that is a very sparse data set because obviously not all the documents include all the words. Um, so there are a lot of missing pieces in the data. So it's very high dimensional, very sparse. And in those cases, having more and more data is very beneficial. Same is true for recommendations. If they want to do recommendations of different items, they probably have millions of items, uh, you know, billions of customers probably. That's, again, a very sparse data set. A lot of customers simply haven't seen some items, have not experienced those movies, have not read those articles. Um, so this, this is high dimensional and sparse. So I think that's a completely valid statement that those kinds of problems need more data. And even very basic algorithms can uh, drive a lot of value uh, if you have a lot more data. 
But this is simply not the problem that most analysts uh, face. This is not the dilemma that they need to solve. Uh, so the dilemma is more like, if you have a certain amount of data, should you go for some, some large-scale algorithm, you know, the H2O, the Spark, ML, Lib, and all those fancy new uh, projects, or should you simply subsample the data and use R, Python, whatever your best favorite tool is? Uh, so, do you need, really need all that data for your modeling? For, or you can just simplify the problem by, by taking a sample uh, and executing your, your predictive models, your machine learning models on your simple laptop. So, in this case, um, I would say that the decision is not that clear. So, it's not always that the, the data wins. It's not always that you, you need to use all. Um, and I would like to kind of revisit some machine learning problems and provide some recommendations um, on, uh, on what could be the best approach in, in different cases. So, in case any of you have been present in Amsterdam last year, I've, I've presented uh, this slide of, of having kind of a breakdown of different machine learning problems um, and recommendations on when to go for subsampling and a simple solution, and when to go for a large-scale uh, modeling approach. So, in case of recommendations, um, as I said with the Google example, uh, this is a high, very high dimensional uh, problem, very sparse data. So, usually a customer um, has experienced and rated, for example, a few hundred of those items. Uh, so, it's very sparse. Uh, so, in case you can fit in a single machine and you have reasonable execution time in a single machine, you can do that on a single machine. But if you have more data, it's always beneficial uh, to go for, for Mahout, go for Spark, go for whatever um, your, your favorite uh, large-scale machine learning tool is, um, and, and do the modeling there. So th this is a clear cut. If you have more data, use it. There's also another area where, where this is quite, quite a clear cut. Um, anomaly detection, so when you are trying to spot some strange behavior, for example, fraud detection, or some, some data collection problems that is uh, messing up your reports. Um, all these kinds of things, if you start to downsample, you may be losing those interesting records. So if, if you are downsampling a fraud data set, you may be sampling out fraud cases, and you will not be able to identify those fraud cases. Obviously, that's not what you want to do. Um, so in most of the cases, you should just go for, for all the data. If it doesn't fit your, your single machine systems, its single machine algorithms, then you, go, then you should go for the large-scale implementation. So these are, so far, uh, seem to confirm um, what, what you have seen from the Google papers and what you have seen recommended by many people uh, around the world. On the other hand, there are some some kind of more classic machine learning problems like clustering, classification, regression, um, where this is not uh, necessarily the case that more data is always beneficial. Um, so last year I, I introduced some, some kind of rules how to decide, a rule of thumb to make it easier for, uh, for you to, to come up with, with a good approach. Um, so there's a lot of uh, theoretical background to it, um, how, for example, a clustering algorithm, k-means algorithm, uh, is changing depending on the data size. So what is the, the noise, what is the error that is introduced by subsampling the data? Um, and I simply, just to simplify this, this decision tree on the right, uh, is that if you have a lot of features, or if you have a lot of clusters that you want to find, then you should go for the large-scale implementation. If it's not the case, so if you have a limited set of features, like a few dozen or even less than 10, um, and probably large clusters, so you, you're, you're trying to cluster your data set to I don't know, eight or 10 clusters, uh, then you can probably subsample and you will still have the same results. Um, and we have a lot of follow-up discussion um, after my, my talk last year uh, with different people if this is really the case and they wanted to see some experiments. Uh, so I started to do some experiments with, with clustering. Obviously, there is room for, for some more, and I encourage everyone interested in this to, to reach out and, uh, and have some collaboration on this, but I, I wanted to share some uh, experiments with you. So, 
I'm not even using a very big data set for, uh, for, uh, for this. You have been hearing about petabytes this morning. Uh, so I was simply generating a, a very basic data set, 10 million records, five numerical attributes, uh, and running a clustering algorithm on it uh, that is trying to identify five different clusters uh, in this data set. So basically, this data set would fit on your single computer. Uh, however, most of the algorithms that you could uh, run for clustering would quite take quite some time to, to execute fully on this data set because usually these, these machine learning algorithms are not linear uh, in terms of execution time um, with the number of records. So it's at least quadratic or even in, in, in worst case it's even, even higher complexity. Uh, so you prefer to run with, with less records uh, to have a reasonable execution time. So what I've been doing um, and it seems that we will be missing the content here again. Um, so what I've been doing is that I've run the, the clustering algorithm on 100% of the data. So the clustering happened including all the data points and I consider the result of this clustering as kind of the gold standard. So that's the best clustering we can get with the most data that we have. Um, and then started to downsample the data. So let's see what happens with the result if I only use 50% of the data. What happens if I use only 10% of the data? Uh, and so on. Um, so how does the, the result change? So in terms of clustering, you are grouping different records into different groups. Um, so you can measure the difference between clusterings if you see um, how many records belong to different groups. So if I have two clusterings and only one record is transitioned to one cluster to another, but otherwise it's the same, then I have one record which is different between those clusterings. So when I was executing these uh, clusterings, um, when I downsampled to 50% of the data, uh, then figured out that one out of every two million records have changed clusters. So it means that out of those 10 million records, only five data points became part of a different cluster. So it doesn't seem like a big change in terms of the clustering results, right? Um, so it probably doesn't really make sense to run on 100% of the data um, if you get basically the very same result with 50% of the data. And the runtime is not just, uh, the, the multiplier is not just two, but probably four or even eight uh, because of the complexity of the algorithm itself. So if you start to downsample um, more, you cannot see it, so I will share uh, some of the information. Sorry, really sorry about this. I, it must be some compatibility problem. Um, so if you are using only 1% of the data, which means basically instead of 10 million records, you're using 100,000 records, which is really a piece of cake these days with, with the available memory, um, then you will have Data, one data point changing in every 50,000 uh, data points. Uh, so in percentages, you cannot even express. It's 99.9999. Uh, so it's, it's very, very little difference between those clustering, even if you are using 1% of your data. Um, and it runs in a few seconds. And you basically get the very same segmentation, the very same clustering of your data set. Uh, some notes and warnings uh, about uh, these kinds of results. We had more of these with different um, uh, number of attributes, different number of dimensions. Um, and this is really just a basic, simple ex experiment. So other kind of data sets may behave differently. But kind of the, the takeaway message here is if you have a very low dimensional clustering, you know, 5, 10, 15 dimensions, Usually, a large-scale execution of a k-means algorithm, for example, simply doesn't make sense. You will have no benefit in running on millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of records. You can just simply downsample to one million and still deliver the very same cluster centroids, the very same cluster model. So you save human effort, uh, you save uh, execution time, so, and still have the same uh, predictions, the same results. Obviously, if you, if you refer back to, to the Yahoo presentation this morning, uh, they are, with some of their machine learning models, they are trying to address 
billions of parameters. So in this case, k-means with, with these five numerical attributes and five clusters, it has 25 parameters. So if you are trying to uh, estimate 25 parameters, you obviously do not need a lot of data. But if this data set becomes, or the problem itself becomes high dimensional, a lot more parameters, or a lot of clusters, that also means a lot of parameters again, um, then you may end up in a situation when you need to use that data to estimate those parameters properly. So the more dimensions, uh, the more clusters, you may need the large scale solutions. But uh, what I see is that 80% uh, in our customer base who are using clustering are simply doing like a few dozen uh, attributes and probably 10 clusters. And that simply doesn't call for a big data solution. You can always go back and, and apply that clustering model to all your data set. But for building the model, you do not need all your data. So moving to, to classification, uh, which is a much uh, broader area, I would say. Um, there are a lot of different models uh, for classification regression um, that you can use. A lot of different machine learning techniques uh, available. So it's really hard to, to say a simple rule of thumb uh, what should I do? Uh, because different models behave differently. For example, decision trees or naive base have different number of parameters that you need to estimate. Uh, they have um, different effect when, you, when there is noise around. Um, so there is really no simple rule um, to, to do that. So what I introduced last year is uh, that you should, you should probably investigate uh, this, these charts, so-called the learning curves. So the learning curve um, is something that you start to use more and more of your data uh, and trying to estimate the accuracy of your, of your predictions. So if you are building your model on 1,000 records, 10,000 records, 100,000 records, um, and checking the um, the performance of those predictions, uh, then you will get uh, a curve like the blue one over there um, that for your training set, uh, no, sorry, the, gr the green one, uh, that your error is going down on the training set. Um, and whenever this, this learning curve starts to become horizontal and there's no improvement over time with adding your data, um, then you, you kind of saturated the, the problem, so there's no use in adding more data. You will not have a better algorithm at all. So again, um, we started to do some experiments with Spark ML Lib uh, and use the logistic regression algorithm available in there um, and try to investigate how those predictions change by, again, start to decrease the data size uh, for, for the modeling. So in this case, it has been a, a real data set. Some of you may have uh, may be familiar with this data set. It's a flight data set. It includes uh, individual records from all the flights made in the United States for, for the time period of, of more than 20 years. So it includes data on, uh, on the departure time, arrival time, uh, what kind of the, the weather situation around, uh, you know, the delay of those flights, uh, all kinds of information, like 40, 50 attributes. Um, some of that you, you really cannot use in logistic regression because of uh, not being numerical, but including information like um, if it was a Sunday or not, or which um, airline has been operating the flight. Um, so in this, with this real data set, the, the prediction problem could be is that you're trying to predict if those flights will be late or not. So being late, there's a lot of ways to define it. My definition has been that a flight is late if it's more than five minutes late. So it's, it's very common to be a few minutes uh, here and there, um, but uh, being five minutes late is kind of significant late that, uh, that you can try to predict. It means that, that out of all of the flights, about 30% is late. So this, this is a relatively balanced data set in terms of the uh, label attribute, in terms of the outcome of those predictions. So again, what I did, started to do the modeling on all the data set. Uh, obviously, you cannot build a 100% model uh, on this data set. It's impossible to predict uh, completely accurately uh, how those flights will behave. Uh, but I kind of considered 
the training um, based on 100% to be the gold standard. So whatever predictions that model produced, those have been the gold standard, and I compared all the subsequent models, all the subsequent uh, predictions to that gold standard. So when I started to uh, subsample again with 50% uh, and, and checked how the predictions changed, how many differences have been in those predictions, uh, it turns out that one difference have been there in every 70,000 predictions. So I cannot do the math uh, right now, but uh, it's really just a couple of differences uh, between those models. So if you have uh, investigate, we also investigated obviously the model parameters, so for logistic regression, there are different parameters that the model is learning. Um, and those have been essentially the same. So very small differences in, in those uh, weights of, of, for the different features. So as I started to subsample more, uh, with 1% of the data set, uh, I ended up with one difference in every 20,000 uh, predictions. So if you consider that most of these predictive problems probably have the accuracy of I don't know, 80%, 90%. So if, if you can predict something for, for 90 per, 95%, that's pretty awesome. That's not typical. So, for example, if you can predict the stock exchange, if you can do it for 51%, you are pretty good. Um, and, and you will be very rich very soon. Um, so most of these predictive problems cannot really shoot for 400%, for but if they can achieve like 90%, and your model has kind of the fluctuation based on the sample that you use um, of one out of uh, 20,000. Sorry about the slides. Um, it means that 99.99% the same. So you will have the same accuracy. So it will be 90% uh, for your predictions. Again, independent of learning on 100% of the data or 1% of the data. In terms of execution time, learning on 100% uh, would probably mean running for hours uh, in you know, distributed Spark cluster. Uh, learning on 1% would mean that you have 1.2 million records that you can load into Python or R or whatever um, and, and run it in a few seconds again. So it's, it's again a waste of human effort, a waste of execution, a waste of uh, computing power, uh, to build these models which do not really benefit from more data. Again, uh, single experiment, um, more experiments should be done uh, to, to kind of validate when the switch should, should happen of, of using in-memory or, or distributed tools. Um, but in case you, you have a low dimensional problem for classification, um, then it's really rare to, to need a large scale model. So you do not have the amount of parameters that you need to optimize, that you need to learn um, to, to really s confirm that you, you need a big data solution for that. So as the, the model par number of model parameters grow, for example, with, for example, deep learning has quite a lot of, of parameters that you need to learn there. So you need large data sets to approach that. Um, but in case you only have like a few attributes or a few dozens of attributes and relatively simple models, it really doesn't make sense to, to go for the large scale solutions. Um, so this is nothing against Spark or Spark MLlib or any of the projects that I have mentioned. It's more like um, kind of a, a machine learning best practice, how you approach your machine learning problems. Um, so it's not, not a tool that will help you um, get up and running quickly and, and accomplish your predictions faster, but it's more like the approach that you take. Um, so if you realize that you do not benefit from these, uh, from these large data sets for, for that particular prediction problem that you need to solve, then you should simply subsample and go with the easy way and not spend days, weeks, months on learning Spark, learning different uh, technologies. Um, Obviously, some companies have very large-scale problems, large-scale prediction problems like Yahoo. Um, so they do use Spark, and they should, uh, because it makes a lot of sense for them. It's, it's a great product, a great technology. Um, but I, I would encourage everyone to be critical about when to use these big data technologies uh, and when to go for some, 
some classic solution. Uh, so thank you for your time. Um, we have some, some time for questions, so if you have anything to, to ask, then go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the classification, uh, for clustering, the model was pretty stable uh, in terms of um, um, if, you, if you have been running for multiple iterations. Uh, so there was uh, not just noise in the data, but there have been uh, relatively separate clusters. And I agree that um, if that those are really separate, that obviously based on small data, you can better learn it. Uh, for classification, predicting if the flight is late or not, uh, I believe we ended up uh, around 80% prediction. Uh, so it was not a very, very strong prediction per se. Um, just <coughs> I, am, I understand the, uh, that for clustering, the experiment that you have done makes sense. For the classification, I really don't agree that it makes any sense for us because um, Nobody is facing six uh, variables uh, when they need to, to, to build a model. In general, the number of variables is much more, and uh, the, the major problem we, have, we are facing is uh, the selection of the, 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 the feature. Um, and for the selection of the feature, the, stronger, the, 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 signal, uh, the, the ratio between signal and noise is very important. And for the variance of your, ch of your, your choice, it's also very important to have a lot of data. So, I mean, what does that, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but what does that mean to say I'm experimenting with six, six variables? It's just the end of the story. The beginning of the story is when you're facing maybe uh, 700 variables and you have to make a choice, uh, maybe six or seven among them, but that's the major problem we are facing, not just Yeah, that's more, the, uh, yeah, I, I agree. That's more like a um, feature selection problem that you have then. Uh, but whenever you actually estimating the parameters from the features selected, those are very few. So the, the first step that you need to make, and then you may need uh, all your data to select those features. Uh, but not all models are helping much with that. So um, yeah, I agree. But if you have 700 uh, variables, then you know the decrease, um, you know the differences that you see when you start to subsample uh, may, be, may be larger. But still, with 700 uh, parameters, we should do an experiment with your data probably. But uh, I expect that even with subsampling, it will be a pretty similar model. Um, OK. I, I would love to do the experiment. <laughs> but you're not very happy to give me the data, I guess. Uh, just to say that one thing that is also going into your direction is when you want to go into production, um, most of the time you want to simplify your model and not going crazy with hundreds of variables and maybe a very complex model. So this really makes sense uh, for production systems that are really needing real-time response um, lower latencies. Yep. So, yeah, I agree that um, if you... If these model building steps are executed much faster, uh, then it's much easier to iterate on that, much easier to update your models, much easier to integrate it into an operational environment. Um, and if, if there is no benefits um, of, of running on more data, then why would you complicate your operational system? How about scaling uh, 
regression problems, like predicting a numer numeric value. Any thoughts on, on that? Um, I would say that all of these, uh, these problems comes down to, to the number of parameters that you are trying to estimate. So if, if your regression problem um, is also low dimensional, then you have a small number of parameters. Uh, so relatively small amount of data will be able to estimate them properly. Um, so for example, for time series predictions, obviously you have quite a, a huge dimensional space. Um, so it's not the case, but um, in, in terms of, of lower dimensional problems, I would say that the same rules apply like for classification. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch.